Hello, my name is Shahriar Shahriari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory linear algebra based on my book, Retrolinear. The subject of this lecture is linear independence of eigenvectors. So let's get started. I, let me remind you of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. I, I will do this for linear operators, uh, but, but it, the same um, definitions will work for matrices as well. So V is a vector space and T is a linear operator from V to V. So linear operator means just the linear transformation from a vector space to itself. And uh, if you have a vector in that vector space, that's not the zero vector, but when you apply the function T to it, you get a multiple of itself. You get Lambda times V where Lambda is some scalar. Then um, that Lambda, that scalar is called an eigenvalue of that linear transformation. And V is called an eigenvector for it an eigenvector corresponding to lambda. Now, um, if you have an n by n matrix, matrix, you can also think of it as a linear operator from Rn to Rn. You take n tuples and multiply the matrix by it, and you get another element of Rn. So matrices are also um, an example of linear operators, and therefore the same definition works for them. Now, um, we also talked about... Uh, diagonalizability in a previous video or many previous, a number of previous videos. If you don't know what those are, you need to go back and, and watch those. So if the vector space is dimension N, and if you have a linear operator from V to V, then it's diagonalizable. What does that mean? That means that you can find the right basis for V so that if you find the matrix of T with respect to that basis, you get a diagonal matrix. This happens if and only if T has n linearly independent eigenvectors. Um, the reason you need n linearly independent eigenvectors is because those will be the elements of your new basis. And if you use those eigenvectors um, as the basis for your vector space of dimension n for both the domain and the codomain, and then find the matrix of the linear transformation T with respect to that basis, then you will get a diagonal, um, diagonal matrix. Again, watch the previous videos about matrices of linear transformations, uh, what they do and how we find them, as well as um, ones about diagonalizability. So for this reason, we are interested in finding for this uh, reason. I mean, you don't have to know that to follow the rest of this lecture, but this is the motivation for why we are interested in linearly independent eigenvectors. So you might have a whole bunch of eigenvectors um, coming at you. You don't really need all of them, but you want to find as many linearly independent ones as you can because you want to make a basis for your vector space out of those uh, eigenvectors. And to be a basis, you need to span. So there need to be enough of them and they need to be linearly independent. Now, uh, the point is that we like linear, uh, we like eigenvectors to be a part of our basis. But the point is that eigenvectors themselves also like to be a part of a basis and it, therefore they help us out by often being linearly independent from each other. And so here's the theorem that I want to prove and the only purpose of this lecture, although I will say some concluding remarks where I will tell you slightly generalizations of this fact, is that if you have a vector space and if you have a linear operator from V to V, assume that you find a whole bunch of distinct eigenvalues of T. So lambda one through lambda K are not the same as each other and they're eigenvalues of T. So again, that means that for each of them, there's a vector that if you apply t to it, you get that uh, lambda i, for example, times the vector again. So because, because of that, pick one eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1. So that means t of v1 is lambda 1 v1, another one corresponding to lambda 2, and so on, uh, all the way till one uh, um, uh, corresponding to lambda k. So you took k different eigenvectors, one for which, uh, each of the eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues are distinct, then what this theorem says is that automatically these uh, vectors are going to be linearly independent. None of them is going to be a linear combination of the other ones. Uh, the only way to write a linear combination of them equal to zero, the zero vector, is if all the scalars are zero. So this is automatic. You don't have to check. So if you pick a, a, a vector that's an eigenvector for this uh, um, um, eigenvalue and another vector that's an eigenvector for another um, uh, eigenvalue, those two will automatically be linearly independent. In fact, more than that, if you pick one for each of the eigenvalue, then the whole collection 
will be linearly independent. So why is that true? This is not obvious. This is not something that if you're just sort of thinking about it, you would just assume uh, you would have to prove it. And, and here comes the proof. So we want to show that this set of eigenvectors is linearly independent. And we're going to use a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume that the set was linearly dependent. Um, and, and, and when a set is linearly dependent, if you write it in some order, then that means that either the first element is the zero vector. Now, this, none of these can be the zero vector because eigenvectors are automatically, by definition, never zero. Or the second one is a linear combination of the first one, the third one, or, or if that's not the case, the third one is a linear combination of the first two, and so on. So at least one of them is going to be a linear combination of the ones that come before it in the, least, in, in the list. So um, one of the vectors is linearly dependent on the ones before. So let's say that VI is the first such vector. So VI is the first vector in that list that's a linear combination of the ones before. Maybe that's the last one. It's possible, but it could happen earlier. So, so um, what we are now assuming is that the first I minus first ones are linearly independent, V1 through VI minus one, and VI, the ith one, is a linear combination of the ones before. I mean, um, it could be that VI is the second one. That's possible. And so then V1 is linearly independent, and then V2 is a linear combination of that. It could be that um, VI is the last one, and, and all of them other than that last one are linearly independent, and, uh, and that last one is the linear combination of the ones before, or something in between. OK. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to apply the linear transformation T to both sides. Um, VI equals this linear combination. So if I find T of VI, it's going to be the same as T of that guy. So T of VI is the same as T of alpha 1 V1 plus alpha 2 V2 plus alpha I minus 1 VI minus 1. But T is a linear transformation. So that means that I can break up those sums and I can bring the scalars out. Whenever you have a linear transformation and you see T of a linear combination, you have an irresistible urge to split it up and make it a linear combination of the images of those individual things. So because of T being a linear transformation, um, what we get is alpha one T of V1 plus alpha two T of V2 all the way till alpha I minus one T of U or I minus one. But now we remember that V1, V2 through VI minus one were not just any random vectors walking around, they were actually eigenvectors. So when I apply T to them, you, I get a scalar multiple of themselves. And in fact, I get a scalar multiple. I know what the scalar multiple is. T of V1 is lambda 1 V1 because V1 is an eigenvector for lambda corresponding to lambda 1. And uh, T of V2 is lambda 2 V2 because V2 is an eigenvector corresponding to lambda 2 all the way till the end. So I get this sort of um, uh, alpha 1 lambda 1 V1 plus alpha 2 lambda 2 V2 all the way till alpha I minus 1 lambda I minus 1 VI minus 1 for what T of VI is. But VI itself is an eigenvector. And, and uh, and so T of VI is also lambda I VI. So if I replace that, I get this relationship. So, so far, this is what I know. We need to keep that. And we'll come back to it and use it in just a second. So I know that lambda I VI, what was VI? VI was that first vector that was linearly dependent on the ones before. We are in the middle of a proof by contradiction and, and we're looking for a contradiction. And now we find out that the lambda I VI is this combination of the ones before. So, VI was already a linear combination of the ones before. And now I find that lambda IVI is this other linear combination of the ones before. Okay, so what, what with that? So, so, so far, that's what I have. I have that written up on the top here, what we have. But I'm going to find lambda IVI separately. So VI was alpha 1, V1, alpha 2, V2, plus alpha I minus 1, VI minus 1. I can actually multiply by lambda I, um, lambda I both sides, and I will get a new relationship for lambda IVI. So lambda IVI is also uh, this other relationship. It's alpha 1 lambda IV1 plus alpha 2 lambda IV2 all the way till alpha I minus 1 lambda IVI minus 1. Now, um, I have, and I have that other one that I had from the previous slide, that lambda IVI is alpha 1 lambda 1 V1 plus alpha 2 lambda 2 V2 all the way till alpha I minus 1 lambda I minus 1 VI minus 1. And I'm going to subtract the two of them. If I subtract the two of them, on the left-hand side, I'll get the zero of the vector space because I'm subtracting lambda I VI from itself. On the right-hand side, I can collect terms and I will get alpha one times lambda I minus lambda one V1 plus alpha two times lambda I minus lambda two times V2 all the way till alpha I minus one, lambda I minus lambda I minus one VI minus one. 
But remember that the first i minus first vectors were supposed to be linearly independent. Why? Because vi was supposed to be the first one that was linearly dependent on the ones before. So these guys are linearly independent, yet I wrote some linear combination of, of um, equal to zero. How could that be? How could you write a linear combination of elements that are um, linearly independent equal to zero? Well, you can uh, as long as you cheat and you only use scalars that are zero. So it must be that all those scalars are zero. Now, here comes the fact that the eigenvalues were distinct. None of these guys are equal to each other. So lambda i is not the same as lambda one, lambda i is not the same as lambda two, lambda i is not the same as lambda i minus one. So those are not zero. So how could the product of these two scalars be zero? Now I know that all the alphas must be zero. All alpha one through alpha i minus one must be zero. But then that means that vi is zero because vi was this um, linear combination um, of, um, of alphas. But, but the zero vector is not an eigenvector, and this is a contradiction, and now the theorem is proved. Okay, so let me give you one uh, quick corollary. If you have an n-dimensional vector space, and again, a linear operator uh, from uh, uh, V to V, if it has n distinct eigenvalues, so um, dimension of the vector space is n, and if this linear has uh, the transformation also has n different eigenvalues, then uh, we can say that T is diagonalizable. Why is that? Well, because each one of those eigenvalues will have at least some non-zero eigenvector. I mean, some eigenvector, which automatically will be non-zero. And that collection, we just proved is linearly independent. So we will have our n linearly independent eigenvectors. And therefore, the matrix will be, uh, the, the linear transformation will be diagonalizable, as will be the matrix of this linear transformation with respect to any basis. Um, and, and likewise, we can say the same thing about matrices. So um, if, if a matrix has n distinct eigenvalues, then it's diagonalizable. Um, okay. Um, I, I can actually say that this, the theorem that I proved is actually, you can make it more stronger. There's an actually stronger theorem that I want to tell you about. To tell you that about, I have to remind you of eigenspaces, which was the subject of a previous video. I urge you to watch that if you know what, don't know what an eigenspace is. So if it's a vector space, again, we have a linear operator. That's our setup all along. Um, if you have a scalar lambda, regardless of whether or not it's eigenvalue or not, you can define this set V sub lambda, which is all the extra vectors X in V with T of X equals lambda X. Now, if lambda is an eigenvalue, then there will be plenty of elements in this V of lambda. If that lambda is not an eigenvalue, the only element in here will be X equals zero, which is not an eigenvector, but always will be in V lambda. Uh, and this guy V lambda is called the eigenspace of T belonging to lambda. And, and so what we showed in, the, in that previous video or talked through it, was that this the eigenspace is a, is a subspace of V. It's all the eigenvectors for lambda together with zero. We throw in zero, which is not an eigenvector, into this set, and then that, that becomes a subspace, and therefore it has dimension and so forth. And um, non-zero elements of V lambda are exactly the eigenvectors of T corresponding to lambda. And if V lambda is some anything other than the zero vector, then lambda is an eigenvalue for T. And V lambda is actually the null space, the kernel, null space and kernel are um, interchangeable words, a null, null space of this linear transformation, lambda times identity minus T. So, um, so, 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 it's, it's, so it's that null space. So what? Well, instead of the uh, theorem that I actually proved, there's this more stronger theorem that, that can be proved. And actually the proof is very similar to the one I proved. It's just that you have to carry around a lot more notation uh, the proof is in the book, but I'm not going to go through the proof here. It's, it's just tedious, a little bit more tedious uh, than the previous one. But the idea is the same. So V is a vector space, and you have a linear operator. Prior to in the previous theorem, we put one um, uh, eigenvector for each eigenvalue. But now he, what we do is we say, OK, let's pick our uh, distinct eigenvalues like before. Before, we picked one eigenvector for each of these. But this time, I pick a basis of eigenvector, a basis for V lambda 1. So B1 is a basis for V lambda 1 for that eigenspace. So B1 consists of linearly independent eigenvectors for lambda 1. B2 consists of linearly independent eigenvectors for lambda 2, and all the way till BK consisting of linearly independent eigenvectors for lambda K. And then the, the union of this still will be linearly independent set. So the point is that you don't have to pick one eigenvector for this uh, eigenvalue, one eigenvector for this other one, one eigenvector for this other one. You can pick as many as you possibly can, linearly independent eigenvectors for each of those eigenvalues. 
and then that collection will um, still be linearly independent. And that's a very powerful theorem. Uh, one final thing that I will say is that um, if you are familiar with uh, uh, sums of subspaces, I had a video about that, um, then you can reformulate or rethink of this or uh, look at the same result through a different lens. So if V is a vector space, and again, you have a linear operator, you must be tired of that by now. Um, and if you have distinct eigenvalues, then what you can do is you can find these subspaces, V lambda one, V lambda two, V lambda K, these eigenspaces, and you find, can find their sum. Uh, their sum means that you take, it's all the elements in the vector space V where are of the form something in V lambda one plus something in V lambda two all the way till plus something in V lambda K. That includes all of these eigenspaces because for example, you could take an element of V lambda one and then pick zero for all the other ones. And therefore you, every element of V lambda one is in W, but it's more than that. It's all the sums of elements of V lambda, v lambda one and V lambda two and so forth. So it's, it's the basis for, so it's a basis for W or a spanning set for W would be the union of those bases. Now, what the fact is that this is actually a direct sum, which what it means is that each one of these V lambda ones, its intersection with the sum of all the other ones is also the zero vector. Um, and, 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 and so uh, these, uh, so, so for example, the dimension of W is the sum of their dimensions. And, and so, and because of that, T is diagonalizable if and only if W is V. That's sometimes the case, sometimes not. But the point is that these eigenspaces do not intersect at all. Um, and that comes from the fact that uh, the, 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 their bases are linearly independent from each other. And so if you want a basis for W, you just find uh, the union of the basis uh, of, of each of these. And uh, the dimension of W is does just the sum of the dimension of these guys. Um, I said that a little bit too, too quickly. I didn't go through the details here. This is just in case you know about the sums and direct sums and so forth, and know that uh, uh, we can talk about eigenspaces in that language. That's the end of this lecture. I will see you in the next one.